Jackson's thriller Spandau's True and some very suggestive movements from Jane Fonda. Strong language as BBC Two takes an nostalgic trawl back in time to 1983 with some famous old rat called Roland. Evening all, welcome to 1983 was the year a grateful nation and sinking TV station, TVAM, gained me, Roland Rat Genius, yeah! The world was a better place thanks to me and this lot coming up. Here, how much am I getting paid for this load of rubbish? One man can make a difference. Let's play Blockbuster. Not the day, please, Bob. I remember when we had such fun and everything was fine. I remember when we used to have I'm Skeletor. In 1983, one man made a difference. A knight in shining leather. He was on a crusade to champion the cause of the innocent. It was Michael Knight, and his car was kicked. <laughs> Night Rider, a shadowy flight. A sh- shadowy flight? Night Rider, a shadowy flight into the dangerous world of a man who does not exist. <laughs> Dad said, watch this! It's a car that can talk. You'll love it. I'm the voice of Night Industry 2000. What's that car? What's that car? It's the fastest, safest, strongest car in the world. He solved crimes with the help of his talking car. Was it? And did the car turn into a plane? No. It was four years of non-stop rock and roll, balls out fun. Men and cars. No. Michael Knight, a young loner on a crusade to champion the cause of the innocent, the helpless, the powerless, in a world of criminals who operate above the law. David Asseloff, look at any Asseloff, David. Welcome aboard the Night 2000. Thank you. What's all this? Looks like Darth Vader's bathroom. In order to motivate it forward... I recognize the more rudimentary controls such as the accelerator, Devon. I do know how to drive. In the very beginning, when I saw the script, I knew that it was a monster hit. I just knew it. I called my father and I said, I've just been handed a script about a talking car. And he says, what, are you out of your mind? We used a Pontiac, the very latest model. It just had a great look to begin with. We didn't have to do a lot to it. I mean, we put the little eye in but um, I borrowed that from Battlestar Galactica. So remember the Cylons? (laughs) I don't waste anything. You look at that car now, you think, that car's crap. At the time, it was looked like a really good car. It looked really cool. But now you think, oh, my Honda Civic is better than that. The relationship really started when David fell asleep while driving on his first assignment. The highway patrol goes by and sees, you know, I th- believe that man was asleep at the wheel. What the? What's going on? What did I do? Deny everything. My relationship with the car was that the car was smarter than me. If I may suggest, deafness is always a good approach to law enforcement officers. You shut up. It was a cocky thing, that kit was very cocky, though. 
Michael, I really don't think you should do that, Michael. No, Michael, you're not supposed to do that. I think you should shut the door and put your seatbelt on, Michael. I'm the clever one here, Michael. Michael, look to your left, look to your right, Michael. Michael, scratch your ass. What do you want from me? A little consideration would be a beginning. I am very, very grateful to you. The car used to go forward, go backwards on its own, do a three-point whatever turn on its own. I used to watch that thinking, if you look really closely, hopefully you might be able to see someone's hands on the wheel. There, driving it like this, trying to hide under the dashboard. What would happen if an irresistible force met an immovable object? That car did a lot. It would chat women up. Wow. Chow the G-string off me there, babe. Bonnie, unless I'm mistaken, you seem to be repositioning my main power booster. What a car. Uh, yes. You take the XR3, I'll take Kit. Under the overall, she's 168 centimetres tall, 54 kilos in weight. Other measurements... Kit. Yes, Michael. Shut up. I couldn't really empathise with Michael Knight because he had a really cool car and at the time my dad was driving a, an orange Talbot Alpine with a black vinyl roof which didn't really have the same sort of, you know, Michael, it's time for us to do some crime fighting, you know, where's the Talbot Alpine? Uh, uh. That was about it, really. General Motors was so impressed and thrilled with the kind of coverage they were getting that they decided they might put out a kit 2000 and actually release a model of the Pontiac that was the Knight Rider car. And some guy down in New Orleans got the idea to jump a train with the one he had. And uh, the General Motors board got to thinking that, you know, maybe there'd be more liability in having this on the road than not. So it stopped there. I didn't do very many of the jumps. They wouldn't allow me to do that, but I did a lot of my own driving because I wanted to and because I got really good at it. Be careful. We like to do all of our stuff ourselves. But, uh, you know, it's, if every actor says he does all of his own stunts, he's lying. Hang on, Michael. It's a show that men naturally came to because of this sort of love affair with cars. And uh, I would have to believe that a lot of women liked watching David. A four-year-old child could watch it and fall in love with Michael Knight because he was a hero. The women could watch it because they loved the car. They loved me when I was 20 years younger. <laughs> uh, how many is the invitation for? Two. Interested? Would not miss it for the world? Good. The guys liked it because it was rock and roll, baby. I was Knight Rider, man. I was wearing black and I was hip and I was cool. It was the American James Bond. I wanted to be the first guy who wore black and, and actually was a hero. So I, I opted for black leather. Big buckle belt, trousers kind of semi flares with that leather jerkin. Bit of elastic around the bottom, zip up, decent sized collar. Maybe that jacket should be called the Hasselhoff because it kind of sums him up, doesn't it? David Hasselhoff was really quite dishy then. He thought, oh, he's all right, might get in a car with him. And then I heard his album. No, I wouldn't. <laughs> had a hit record in Austria. A girl had come to meet me from a magazine. She said, oh my, your record Night Rocker is number one in Austria. I said, where is Austria? And she showed me on the map and I said, hmm. Four weeks from that conversation, I was on tour and drew more people than the Rolling Stones. And it just went berserk. I've been looking for Germany looking for freedom. It was number one for eight weeks. David Hasselhoff is here. And the Berlin Wall came down and they chose my song as the national anthem. 
So in 1989, I sang to a million people on the Berlin Wall. With freedom, I have none. I've been looking for freedom. I got 40 gold and platinum records now on my wall because of that little night Rider car. Ein Auto, ein Computer, ein Mann. It aired every place that you make any appreciable money. El coche fantástico. It was enormously successful. I'm sure Mr. Hasselhoff would say he was the star of the show, and uh, Daniel Motors probably thinks the Pontiac was, but uh, they were a successful team. It was perfect for its time. Is this a car or a spaceship? I believe that the camera photographs your aura. Can you take a direct hit, kid? I don't think we want to find that out. I was that character. I wasn't as brave as Michael Knight, but I had a heart like Michael Knight. I still do. And I think the people respond to that. They might walk on the street with me one block with me, and you will see the reaction. It's like they, they everybody knows me as their bud. I was able to affect people all over the world in whatever language. People need heroes. People need dads. She's baby sister Sophie Jane. I'm going to take extra special care of my preemie. Can I hold her? They're one of a kind. They're Cabbage Patch. Cabbage Patch Kids. They make the world go round. Aww. Now, if this is your first delivery, I'll make it as easy as possible. The cabbage is dilated ten leaves apart. Push a baby girl. Oh, isn't that just disgusting? <laughs> uh, you know, I really liked all the shtick about the being born in a cabbage patch and uh, for some reason being wholly enchanted by it. They're not dolls. They're babies. Each has its own personality. They're all individuals, the same as we are. I can point out to you that it's got a horrible outie there. It's only got three toes. It's got grandma's dimpled knees and a King Kurt haircut. I can do an impression of a Cabbage Patch doll if you'd like to say. Is that terrible? What was the big thing with Cabbage Patch dolls? In Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania, it was a near riot. One woman broke her leg. One store official armed himself with a baseball bat. What do we tell our little girl Christmas morning? What are we supposed to say? You've been good, but Santa ran short? In Memphis, Tennessee, pushing, shoving, scratching. This is what the fuss is all about. Pudgy-faced little dolls called Cabbage Patch Kids. These dolls, they didn't do anything, they didn't cry, they didn't pee themselves, they were just rubbish. I was never into them, and they were huge. Everybody wanted a Cabbage Patch doll. I definitely had Cabbage Patch dolls and sent off the adoption certificate and everything. That's, that's terrifying. Promise. I solemnly promise to be an understanding parent. To, to be become an understanding, understanding parent. parent. Here's the prescription for the baby for TLC, which is tender loving care. What's that? In his ass. What does that say? It's got a tattoo on his bum. I mean, come on. It was ahead of its time. I must say, tattoo on his bum. That's pretty good. Come on. Come on. Whoa! Woo! Feel that. That's better. <laughs> Mama got lost. <laughs> I'm sure it didn't hurt a bit. The must-see film of 1983 was a corny dream come true fairy tale. It featured leg warmers, leotards and blow torches. Yeah, what a feeling! I saw Flash Dance. Oh, I loved it. Flash Dance. Oh, please, yeah. Love Flash Dance. Jennifer Beals, Pretty Girl, was supposed to be a welder, which never rang true to me. I mean, I have met welders in my time. None of them looked like Jennifer Beals. And she managed to combine the twin worlds of disco dancing and welding. Perhaps for, uh, you don't see a lot of that in films these days. Hi. 
What? I saw you dance last night. You're Alex. I know. Wasn't he very rich? Yeah, he was very rich, and it was like, you know, she was kind of trailer park trash, and they got it together. It was modern-day Cinderella. I'm Nick Hurley. Really? I've seen your name on my paychecks. The head of the company that she works for is a uh, tall, handsome, strapping guy who wears a hard hat all the time. And uh, so they get together. She has, she has aspirations to become a dancer, and uh, he helps her to fulfill this dream. Flashdance, I think, is the movie that you can trace back the complete demise of Hollywood pictures. <laughs> Flashdance is the, the point where movies cease to have a plot and where everything became a series of scenes. He doesn't need a thing to me. What plot there is is fantastically fascistic and backwards, and yet it was wildly popular, like worldwide popular. I've never known next to me. These are the points of Flashdance that don't work, clearly. She works at a foundry in Pittsburgh where apparently no work is ever done, and yet colored lights shine through every pipe, right? There's always a red, blue, green, yellow light shining through every pipe. She dances in a strip club at night, but not a nasty strip club. I dance at what we like to call in America a titty bar, but the titty bar I dance at is classy. See, we've made that moral distinction. She lives in an exquisite loft in Manhattan, yet the movie takes place in Pittsburgh with a large dog. That's the rocky variable, as I like to call it. <laughs> Sylvester Stallone stuck it in it. If you have a large dog, it doesn't matter what kind of reprehensible heel you are through the whole movie, you're lovable because at those moments when you're most downtrodden and your dream's not about to happen, you can scruffle that dog behind the ears. And then maybe have a cigarette out on your porch woefully. I guess it's a kind of a fairy tale. I never thought that people would take it very seriously. I thought it was a bit of fluff, you know. When I was a kid, all I wanted was to be able to afford to eat in restaurants like this. Were you poor? Poor. I was so poor, I had hand-me-down lunches. I just love the scene where she's trying to seduce this man by eating lobster. And it's so messy and gucky and awful, yet she still really want to take her home and give her one. And I just thought only she could do it like that, really. I've never actually tried it myself. You like phone booths? Phone booths? You probably just like doing it in bed, right? I didn't know that Jennifer had this cut-off vest at the time. It was just a bib with no back nor sides. And so it was a complete surprise to me when she took off her jacket and when she uttered the, the line that she did um, to the woman who played my wife. Is he taking you to the steel mill yet? That's enough, Katie. He likes to go there on his first date. It was your first date, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. As a matter of fact, I fucked his brains out. <laughs> Obviously, you did. I read the screenplay and I just thought it was bad, to be absolutely honest. And I turned it down actually a couple of times. In a world made of steel. The third time, I thought maybe I can make the, the, the dancing interesting, maybe I can do something with that. And so I said yes. What a feeling. What a feeling. When she was in front of the board and she just did this dance, I thought, go for it, girl, go for it, you know. There's that great scene where she kind of runs really elegantly and it just splits. 
and I used to try, I used to clear <laughs> all the furniture to one side of the room in our living room to try and get a run up to do that, and I'd always end up like headbutting a wall or a door. It was just farcical. Flashdance to me and my contemporaries was a very uncool film. Something like Flashdance was just far too mainstream, and, and if you didn't know a girl that that that, um, that said they liked it, then you'd probably dump them. No, I loved it. Loved Jennifer Beals. Very much wanted to look like that. I would have given anything to have been dancing in that film and, you know, having legs as long as hers that were as lean and toned as hers. All the body parts are mine. She had a body double. No! The hips and the legs and the foot. No way! I did all the dancing. I would say 99% of it. Don't tell me that. She never danced in the film except in the opening number uh, in the bar where she shakes her head. In the end, sort of audition, there were, I think, five different dancers. You know, we had a, we had a break dancer. In the scene at the end, I did as Jennifer Beale's double, and I'm spinning on my back. I'd love to have been there, there the day they were filming that. I wonder how that bloke felt, having to kind of tuck his tackle in and put that leotard on. Well, a poor man, I mean, he was very embarrassed because he had to, A, he had to wear a wig. I was like, yo, you better give me some money for this. <laughs> he had to shave his legs, I think. I wasn't groomed to be an actor or anything like that where they'll be like, oh, well, yeah, cool, all right, so you need me to shave my legs, and I'll, you want, I'll, I'll shave my ass too, just in case, you know? No, I wasn't having that. Where do you put your tackle when you're break dancing? What are you trying to say about me? <laughs> I don't remember what we did. That's, uh, uh, I'm leaving. <laughs> I got a bump. <laughs> Women have always flung themselves at me. They just love my hairy chest. Yeah. But you ugly blokes, you need a bit of help at the end of the night. Well, in 1983, you got it with the ultimate smoochy song. <laughs> I was in love when I wrote True, you know. It's an un unrequited love, which is always the greatest inspiration on any writer. I remember thinking, well, you know, this has got something. This is going to get under people's skin. And it did. So true, funny how it seems. It stayed at number one for a long time, and it became the soundtrack to people's lives and their love affairs. Head over heels when to do to. True was that one of those ones where lights come on at two o'clock in the morning and people look with horror at the people that they've been sort of uh, struggling with their underwear with for the last five minutes. Well, I want a ticket to the world But now I've come back to... Tony Hadley's voice, I don't think, lends itself to sort of smoochy ballads because it's not like Marvin Gaye, the kind of insinuating, seductive whisper. He sounds like he's been put through a public address system at a football match all the time, Tony Hadley, doesn't he? True, funny how it's like, will the man whose car is parked at West Entrance? So true, funny how it's in all. And you just think, well, no, you're not going to seduce anyone like that, are you? Like a bloke singing through a megaphone. Again. Why do I find it hard to write the next line? Oh, I want the truth to be said. Last record of the night. Um, that was, that could be a very, very nerve wracking time. I really miss smooching. It was such an important part of how you kind of pulled. The last dance, you had to be paired off with mm -hmm. someone. You had to have someone's tongue rammed down your throat, no matter who it was. But I always remember, you could never have a kiss without a hard-on. There would always be <laughs> that hard-on. You'd dance with your bum sticking out. Not knowing how to handle this kind of beast <laughs> appeared down the trousers. 
guy Steve, I remember, got slightly yeah, got slightly saucy with me actually, and one of his hands did sort of slightly go southwards. Went south. And I did the classic. Now, of course, you're, you're actually ramming the hand down there. It's strange that you just <laughs> desperately. It's, it's just like I'm not interested. Hand. You would dance with a girl, and you would try and wedge your knee. Gusset, I suppose, and then sort of move her around. Am I the only one doing that, or did people do that? Or, yeah. And then, and then you would try and get your hand down the front, and it was like, which is like trying to stroke a dog through a letterbox, if I remember. And because uh, they, they would never undo their top button of their jeans, it was all hard work. Then my makeup would run. <laughs> and I suppose, uh, you know, they have uh, an erection section at um, a, a sort of, you know, banging sort of garage or. Uh, you know, sort of rave club, do they? But they're missing out. Smitching was the first, that was the foreplay of the snog, really, wasn't it? Yeah. I remember going outside, you know, against the wall and thinking, oh, God, let's kiss, you know. And he sort of kissed, and I was like, oh, you know, what's for breakfast? It was <laughs> starting already. My line was always, oh, kissing in public, so techy. In other words, I'm frightened to death of what you might expect from me. So then you'd decide whether, whether, whether the snogging, whether the tongue went in or not. And then he said, don't you do tongues? Why do you put your tongue in somebody's mouth and fish around in there? I mean, I literally thought you just kind of flopped it in their mouth and kind of left it there. I didn't know you wiggled it. It was sort of like... So, the do people still French kiss? <laughs> put, your, put your tongue in somebody's mouth and waddle it about. <laughs> I just can't imagine it. It just seems weird. My little China girl. I always practiced that. I used to go like that. I didn't have the, the suction. It looked like somebody had punched me in, 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 the, in the throat. Then it all went yellow. It faded from yellow to green to pale beige. I used to be covered in hickeys by the end of the evening. And then Were you'd you? go home. Yeah, that's why I still wear these sort of necklines. This girl said, can I give you a love bite? And I went, you go on then, we're not very big. And she went, OK. And then she was at it for about an hour. And it came as like a birthmark all across my face and my neck. It went up to there. I didn't, I didn't have a polar neck large enough to get to it. I think I went down to breakfast in some kind of Elizabethan costume in the end. If you saw a girl with a love bite, it's like, you think, Easy prey, but somebody's been there. Breakfast TV hit our shores in 1983 and TVM sunk like a stone. Nobody was watching. <laughs> that was until I came along and gave the whole thing a bit of class. Yeah! Welcome, Le Roland Rat. <laughs> Buongiorno, Monsorno. He's musical, he can play a mouse organ. <laughs> <laughs> The Roland Rat industry is worth over a million pounds a year in the toy shops. 800 Roland lookalikes are sold every day. We're a rat, and it and, and, and was huge, wasn't it, Roland Rat? Now, recently, some of us over here have noticed a strange construction on the TV AM roof, remarkably resembling a shed. It now appears that we've been joined by another presenter. <laughs> Hello, good morning and welcome. <laughs> Roland Rat basically saved TVM, I think. I mean, TVM was sort of on the, the skids and was, was obviously a rubbish, rubbish TV programme. Um, and then suddenly this bit of sack comes in. Yeah, Rat fans! And instant phenomenon. All those people who've rung in all this week and said, when are you going to get rid of Angela Rippon? Well, your dream has come true, cos I'm not going to be here next week. I wasn't nervous on my first day. I just walked in the place and took over. Yeah! Disney, Disney, one, two, three. Is it working, Kev? Angela Rippon and Parkinson and Frosty were all so boring, they needed a shot in the arm, and that's where I came in. He wasn't that typical, childish, Blue Peter type of... Puppet, was he? He was, he was edgy and funny and rude, and I loved Roland Rat. Time now 
to introduce my special guest star of the day, Christopher Tarrant. This is marvellous, Rob. This yes. is the peak of my career, sitting here with somebody going... Yeah. All the years of working with Gil Good have finally paid off. <laughs> What's the John Feelgood? This is how easily led we are. Oh, no, I didn't... We had Roland Rat, the saviour. And how many TV execs were then at home with pairs of socks? Sewing on eyes, you know, going, right, the rat's been done, what's next? BBC Television has a new star, a personality of great versatility by the name of Roland Rat. Until today, Roland worked for TVAM, but not anymore. He's changing channels to make what one BBC executive today called a major contribution to Light's entertainment. The BBC paid me vast amounts of money to leave TVAM and join the biggest bureaucratic dump in the world. What's your name, love? Leslie Ash. <laughs> That's a strange name, isn't it? <laughs> Good job your first name's not Fag, isn't it? <laughs> Get it? Fag Ash. Yeah. <laughs> Roland Rat was a terrifying creation, but not without interest. I mean, he was very Essexy, Esturine. The telly had never been openly Essexy and Esturine before. We wanted a version up here on Northern TV of a Jack Russell. Do you know what I mean? A little bit bigger that would just turn up and can take his head off. Legend, yeah! It's Roland Rat. I've always seen myself as an all-rounder, so uh, singing obviously came natural to me and my first little number was uh, rat rapping. Great. I only made a couple of songs, rat rapping, I think. <laughs> oh, God. When I went and saw the whole concept of Roland Rat. I talked him into letting us make these rap records. They were hardcore. You know, they were just real hardcore tracks. There was nothing, you know, sort of cheesy or poppy about them. All the songs that we did on the Roland Rat show went on to be big hits for Mel and Kim and other people because we honed our sound on this program. I was a big fan of Roland Rat and I couldn't believe it when he wanted to marry me. Sam Fox and I had a fling, yeah. She was always trying to snog me, she was. Now let's hand back to all the rubbish on BBC One. Yeah, right, Sam, where were we? Do you love me? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> What's happened to Roland Rat now? I should know, I'm married to him. Yeah. Black, obviously. They should have been pink. Fluorescent yellow. Purple ones. Fluorescent green. Rainbow coloured ones. With a big yellow pattern on. Lavender ones. Germaline pink. <laughs> Sequin. And I loved them. I tried it and just felt disgusting. Women wore them on the street in the daytime. And there was lots of lads wearing them. Great big things on the bottom. I look like those poodles. What on leg warmers? Why? Why would you wear leg warmers? <laughs> I just don't know what leg warmers were about. They just kind of made your ankles sweat. They were just stupid things. Thinking it was very cool to walk down the street in a skirt with some woolly things like Nora Bassi halfway down your legs. It was just a look. You kind of wore your leg warmers and your jeans with obviously your jeans tucked into your leg warmer. And who doesn't look good in that? Certainly not me. Leg warmers with jeans, nice. It was very, very important to get your leg warmer to sort of stretch all the way at the bottom. God, I've just spent hours arranging your leg warmers. It was an extraordinarily heinous fashion statement. It altered fashion perspective in that you weren't meant to have something fat and wide around your ankles, which was supposed to be delicate and slim, according to the way that taste was. So, in a way, they were subversive, I think. Oh, God. I do remember... <laughs> I do remember having a pair, yes. I had a go with leg warmers, but it was you know, I couldn't really leave the house in leg warmers. It was something that you'd try on at home and you'd wander around. These brown leg warmers. Oh, God. I can't deny it. I'm sure there's photos. In the late 90s, they came back as a trendy thing and they're still now bubbling around. I actually think we're about to have the resurgence of the leg warmers. My Little Pony's giving her new party frock an earring because today's her birthday. All her friends came in fancy dress. 
Applejack fancied herself as a tennis star. She even brought a racket. And Posy arrived in her aerobics outfit, leg warmers and all. But poor old bow tie forgot it was fancy dress and turned up in her birthday suit. My Little Pony. My Little Pony Pony Wear from Hasbro. Wham, bam, I am a rat. Job or no job, you can tell me that or not. Yeah. 83 was the year of George and Andrew. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, two for the price of one. It's wham! I've never, ever lost my head about a pop group. Except with Wham. I'll never forget the first time I saw them. It was their first ever Top of the Pops appearance. Hey, sir, go. By the time that song was over, I was hooked. Hey, sir, go. It was staggering, it was stunning. They were about to conquer the world. You could see it as clear as anything. They just stood out. You know, you could see that they'd been in those um, bedrooms practicing those sort of like dance routines. They looked, you know, fantastic as well. George had on three quarter length jeans, espadrilles, and a leather bike jacket with no shirt underneath. I was a massive Wham fan. First singles, I still think, are brilliant. They were funny. No one ever gives them any credit for being funny. It's very trendy not to like Wham. I mean, how to say it without sounding so arrogant and so incredibly superior? It was just really naff. Oh, weren't they embarrassing when they judged? Well, nah, they weren't. It was jeans belted right up to here with T-shirts and leather jacket and hair that you did that with a lot. And there was a lot of leaping about on stage in a very uncool way. What Wham said were good times. This was it. This was fun. This was colour. They really were like the two studs round town. They projected one-night standism more than you can imagine. I think Wham were just very sexy, and I, as far as I'm concerned, they captured the market because all the girls wanted to shag them, basically. How do you cope uh, with being treated as the sex symbols by all the 13-year-olds? Uh, We're coping with it. It's a joke. You know, we, re we see the funny side of it. <laughs> hey, everybody, take a look at me. I've got strict credibility. I may not have a job, but I have a good time with the boys that I meet down on the line. Wham was very much aimed at the girls, but boys, it was almost OK to like Wham. Almost OK. If you grew up in certain bits of North London, you went to school with dozens of boys like that. Boys with far too much hairspray and kind of tight trousers and suntans. And you just used to beat them up in the playground. And then suddenly, everyone wants to look like that. It was the ultimate in kind of middle-class, suburban, soul boy nonsense. Looking back on Wham's image, it was pretty bad. It was body conscious uh, sports jogging wear for men. They both wore hot pants. George Michael in hot pants. Oh, my God. Their look was suburban hedonism. Brilliant tans, looking sporty and rich. And it was very important that both of the Wounds were sort of new Commonwealth. You know, that George uh, um, uh, um, was Greek and what's his face? Andrew. Um, was Egyptian, I think, and they, they came from Bushy. You've just seen the typical morning in the life of Wham, but things haven't really... Oh, oh, blah, blah. Once again, should we just do it again? Let's go again. Uh, uh, uh. Wham revived the ancient pop star practice um, uh, of putting things down their trousers. Dear Mommy, 
George Michael used to put a shuttlecock down the front of his pants. I was your only son. George came up with the idea of playing badminton on stage. I mean, it was, it was a rather funny idea. You know, just what he would become. It was George who decided to take one of his uh, shuttlecocks and uh, I remember him sort of, you know, kind of sort of circling it around his belly button. I know it sounds awful now talking about it, doesn't it? But he got away with it. Um, and then sort of, you know, kind of sort of running it down his legs as well and sort of like picking up the sweat. I always kind of wanted to put shuttlecocks down the front of my, my trousers. I didn't even know why I was doing it when I was young, because it didn't really equate that, that he was trying to make his genitalia look bigger. I just thought, wow, that's got to be something I've got to get on board with. I saw them um, getting changed backstage, and um, I mean, I don't have to say this, but, you know, I don't think that either of the boys needed any help in that area. Strangers take you by the hand and lead you to a wonderland underneath their Panamas. Club Tropicana drinks are free and you can suntan. That's what pop music should be about, I think. Simple, joyful and meaningless, essentially. There was people on Lilo's playing the trumpet which music teachers would have been saying, no, you don't want to do that, because that's a, it's a school trumpet, that. And if you go out full of water, your mother and father will have to pay for it. George Michael in a pair of white speedos, hello. They look very sexual and lithe, and George, having been there four weeks beforehand, preparing and get himself thin, I think it was four weeks without eating and getting tanned. It was the boys showing off their uh, tans and also, um, I think, playing the roles of uh, aeroplane pilots. Oh, they were airline pilots. I mean, how camp is that? And I'm still going, but I love him. I'm going to be George's popper-lopper-do wife. Oh, uniforms, I should think. That's what they would have been if they hadn't been pop stars. I don't know. But they looked good in them, didn't they? Yeah. I never really understood how on earth George Michael pulled it off to go from Wham, which, which was a band where he stuffed shuttlecocks down the front of his shorts, to being the most influential artist of the, um, of the 90s. <laughs> The received wisdom, I think, is entirely wrong about George Michael, and that is that he started and he was in Wham! and he was a Berg, and then he matured into a serious artist with something to say, one of the great people. I think it's exactly the opposite. I think he was in Wham! and he was fantastic, and then he became a right old bore, and now, I, you know, I wouldn't open the curtains now if George Michael was playing in my back garden. The thought of them now squeezing into shorts gives you goosebumps, really. It was very much of its time. It never grew old or, or depressing and um, you know they didn't sort of overstay their sort of sell-by date <laughs> oh, oh where was I oh yes <laughs> this book about posh knobs was the best seller of 1983 now what was going on eh <laughs> Stone Ranger was a type of upper middle class girl around London. Oh, to be pitted was the Sloan Ranger. They just wore this kind of horrible, kind of dowdy Barbara Woodhouse style uniform. The pearls, the MA scarf around the bag, flat shoes with a little penny inside like an American college student. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Maybe an Alice, an Alice band? As soon as I saw anyone in an Alice Band and Pearls, I, I would cross the road. One of those um, sort of frilly collar, white frill, frilly collar. <laughs> Stones has a very distinctive way of dressing. They weren't like anyone else. And for the most part, most people were glad of it. The Sloan Ranger Handbook came out in 1983, and it was... It was an absolute must-have for every single person, normally found in somebody's loo. The book 
is a guide to Sloan life, and it's a guide to all the institutions that keep Sloan life afloat. Peter York came to interview friends, and it was all where they ate, what they did, what kind of men they dated, who they were, what they wore. The 80s was a great period of tribal books, and the Sloan Ranger was the first and biggest of them. And what that said was that there were a lot of people around who wanted to know all about other people's lifestyles, presumably because they wanted to swap it for their own. The only one that I really liked was Lady Di, you know, that see-through skirt, that famous shot of her. When the Princess of Wales arrived and people were utterly fascinated by her and at the time thought that she was a mainstream Sloan, she helped us sell and sell and sell. I've got to say, I think, if the Princess of Wales hadn't existed, that book wouldn't have, have come out and sold so many. She was the kind of budding icon. They thought, through her, they could live their life vicariously. You know, she had achieved the ultimate aim. She got the prince, she got the palace, she got the castle. As a result of the Sloan Ranger handbook, sales of certain bits of Sloan kit went through the roof. Absolutely through the roof. So, for instance, the barber. Bloody barber jacket. Suddenly, barbers sold in thousands, and barbers could be bought in the barber department of your local Debenhams. Hunter Wellingtons, now they had to be Hunter Wellingtons, so that's green. And they used to go for the most expensive hunters you can, to try and get them leather lined. They used to make special edition, special edition Wellingtons, I ask you, aimed at rich people. And it's never that wet in London, is it? Those posh, silly buggers. Suddenly, there were just, there seemed to be thousands of them. But what about you sitting there in your very hot uh, barber coat in the studio this morning? Should, I mean, that's very much the country dress, isn't it? You have to wear the barber, it's, yes. it's very much part and parcel. Yeah. Are you a Sloan Ranger? Well, I think it's what people class you as rather than you call yourself. Oh, it wasn't a good thing. It really wasn't. These people with braying voices. Henrietta! And kind of who wanted to turn London into the country. Oh, it was horrible. What's the difference <laughs> between a, a, a Sloan Ranger and a Hooray Henry? Um, well, who, who, hooray, Henry, is get uh, sort of a, a branch of Sloan Rangers who get rather carried away. Um, I, mean, I would have thought that you, with the greatest possible respect, I would yeah, have thought that yes, you so were hooray, true, Henry. Yes, yes. Um, I'm a member of a dining club at Bristol, which um, is in the book, in fact. The male of the species was simpler to identify. Thing, what were they called? They were called Henry. <laughs> Do you to go out with Sloan Ranger girls? I wish I could, but I'm far too ugly. Oh, you're so silly. Hooray, Henrys. Bad kisses. <laughs> Sorry, really bad tongue sarnies. They just didn't know how to kiss. I've got to say, foreign men, I, you know, I had two or three English kisses, and my God, did I then go foreign. <laughs> They were crap in bed, yeah. so you wouldn't want to go and screw them, but you would want them... Yeah, they were like yeah. your best friends. And if you spurned them, they were fine. They were kind of like puppies who came back. <laughs> I don't think a Sloan girl would aspire to marry a Sloan man. She would look beyond that. And I was definitely speaking from experience <laughs> here. Yeah, hooray Henrys. They were all incredibly loud. They were all... Um, Always very pleased with themselves. Hello, Mum. Hello, Mum. Hello. It's me, Justin. What? No, Justin. Well, I think what people don't realise about the Sloan Ranger handbook was that people, Peter was taking the piss. Far be it for me to suggest that there was any satirical objective at all in it. He wrote this kind of handbook laughing at them, and they all rushed out because none of them had too much kind of cultural savvy and, and bought it. I mean, it, uh, that aspect was quite funny. But they, oh. There, there have really been worse people in the re recorded history of mankind. Kids TV in 1983 was all stupid puppets and useless cartoons. Remember Masters of the Universe with Skeletor? Yeah. He needed to get a good meal inside him. And what about Mr. Uh, I Have the Power? He man. Now that idiot must have lived down the gym. <laughs> And the masters of the universe! Well, 
the power of Grayskull. I have the power. I mean, it was always on when you got in from school. That was the great thing. You'd get in and um, you'd have to sit through that awful thing with Rod Hull and Emu, God rest his soul, with grot bags. And then after that, on came He-Man with She-Ra and then the scary skeleton. <laughs> In the 70s, you had kind of Hanna-Barbera cartoons, and it was all very cute. And in the 80s, cartoons became much more sort of high-powered. He-Man now has a mighty Thunder Punch. Thunder Punch He-Man's loaded with caps and ready for battle with the evil spike Toy manufacturers started to realise that cartoons were the best sell-through mechanism for the toys. I, Skeletor, have another warrior named Whiplash. He-Man was really the first one of those phenomena. It was the first time that a show was launched simultaneously with a toy. What followed He-Man were things like Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles and um, Mighty Morphin Power Rangers and, most recently, Pokemon. Spikor is trapped in the slime pit. Not the slime! Yes, my slime will overpower you. There were so many different toys released, I'd, I'm not sure it's possible to collect them all, and they're all so wonderful. He-Man and Bashasaurus with its mighty Basher Ball. Pneumatic pumps that made the characters spin. Skeletor's not prepared for Cyclone's flying fists. Workable arms, movable jaws, spinning waist action so they could have the fights that they did. Mossman, Spikor, Cyclone, Stone Dart, Rizlog, Stinkor. He really stinks. Yuck! We had all the figures, and then after the show finished, you would kind of you know, pretend that you weren't interested while your, your kid brother reenacted fight scenes, but obviously you were quite into it. I am Adam, Prince of Eternia and defender of the secrets of Castle Greyskull. His name was Adam, which was a bonus. Um, subconsciously, that made the girls fancy me just a bit more. Fabulous secret powers were revealed to me the day I held aloft my magic sword and said, By the power of Greyskull! He-Man's physique. Really overly developed muscles. Schwarzenegger and drag, I guess. I'll be back. He-Man had these legs that, that just didn't exist, and kids would be taping, like, legs and lamb to the back of the legs, you know, to look like him. Kids love the idea of transforming characters. Muscles represent power and strength and, and all the things that kids want, you know, being able to get their will and enforce their way and, and be strong and tough. One of the reasons kids will watch videos over and over and over again is to attain a sense of mastery because they know what's going to happen and it makes them feel more in control of their environment. Masters of the universe who had all these fantastic technical advancement in weaponry, in flying. But they lived in a castle with no central heating. They were so busy developing weaponry that nobody ever went so we could double glaze these windows. For all the times that that castle got attacked, you never saw a plumber or a bricky. Skeletor. I played Skeletor, the villain. <laughs> I played Merman. Oh, why didn't you do that before? He lived in the water, so we talked like that. Let me get a little saliva in my throat. Merman always talked underwater. And, and Skeletor was the villain. He was up in here somewhere. <laughs> he was a bad dude. <laughs> that was a big mistake, Skeletor. Not as big as the mistake you're about to make, He-Man. <laughs> I really despised it in the first place, such a weird looking thing, a walking skull, which is enough to give you nightmares to begin with. Well, who asked you, you little vermin? The, the kids on the playground were, you know, calling each other Skeletor or insulting each other with some of the phrases that we used in, in the show. I can't remember his name. There was a skinny kid who had really sunken eyes. And he, <laughs> Isn't it so cool? If you happen to look like someone in a cartoon, that's your whole your whole school day's ruined. If your name's the same as... If it rhymes with somebody that you look like, that's it. Your life's ruined. Yeah, here I come, ready or not. 
It was a tough time because I ended up with the nickname Ram Man. That's the hardest dragon I ever rammed. Ram Man was basically someone with no neck and a metal headdress and, and doingy legs. Anyone who had a weight problem, like myself, suddenly became Ram Man. I am she -Ra. I was more into his sister, she -Ra, princess of power. She can't fight um, the evils of the universe in trousers. She's got to have a short skirt. She had enormous tits. I'm sorry, she had enormous tits. Um, I don't know why, but they were abnormally large. I remember them just going and actually curving under like that and having a flat stomach. And uh, later on in life, I realised that the two don't go. <laughs> Someday all of our worlds will live in peace and there will be no reason to fight or to fear what tomorrow may bring. I pray it will be soon. There would be little pieces of morality in there, little lessons in there, yeah. And it was He-Man's job to point that out. <laughs> Make believe can be fun, and there's nothing wrong with imagining great adventures. But never forget that when it's the real thing, someone can get hurt. Even the good guys. Even you. And two, three, four, five. In 1983, there was a revolution, an aerobics revolution. Punch it out. Two, three, four, five. Oh, I'm exhausted. When aerobics came here and that revolution took off, undoubtedly it changed people's lives. People became fanatics about it. I don't think I considered not doing it. I seem to remember it just at my lunch hour and jump up and I get myself quite exhausted. What do you do? Do what's right. <laughs> right. Game Fonda video is still one of my favourite things to put on late at night. I would sneakily watch the Jane Fonda workouts just to get a, a, a sneak of Jane Fonda moving about gently within her tight lycra. I'm not sure that aerobics were my finest hour. I wasn't cut out to be um, doing strange things to my, you know, to the back of my knee all the time. Let's get physical, physical. I wanna get physical. Let's get I'd seen um, Olivia Newton-John, she was constantly in gym kit, excellent bosoms, thought, if I go to the gym, I'll get those. And uh, put a towel round my neck, wandered around, had some water, went Phew, and then uh, left. That's all I really did at the gym. Well, only the most unfit can have failed to notice that Britain has recently gone keep fit crazy. The shops are full of books and records with lithe young ladies urging us to work out or by doing aerobics to feel that burn. I think it became very fashionable to wear the fasten underneath lycra top. I do remember it taking place. Poppers underneath the pubic region, and this was to be worn, um, obviously on top of the underpant. <laughs> Those things, what, what, what is that? And it goes up there and then a thong at the back. You'd go around looking like a metallic sausage because you'd be squeezed in to these all-in-one lycra creations. The other thing is, is that I think I must have thought they were quite flattering because I used to wander about in my all-in-one lycra, in, at home, in my flat, um, draped around sofas. After I took all my clothes off, I had an indentation of a seam running all the way up my inner leg. Terrible. Right, well, this morning, let's get down to the bottom of things. Back, swing into action. Twist yourself down. The early morning aerobics with the green goddess. Am I right? I think I am. Some would say dumbbells. My first day on uh, breakfast time was really exciting. Come on, Britain. Wake up. Shape up. And stretch up. There I was in a shiny leotard and tights on a very, very cold morning, bare feet. A gentleman, under your coats, put your papers down and your pipes and your umbrellas. Keep fit should be fun. And with a bit of music and a bit of rhythm, it can help us on our way. I call this the monkey. Your body. 
And I think people were just so surprised. I was just so unique. And stretch. It's concentrated. I never joined in. It was too early in the morning. No, I watched for a laugh, I'm afraid. Keep the tummy pulled in and the back nice and straight. It's not only the balls that bounce on this court at Roehampton, it's a lot of the members too. Shake it out. Shake it out. Just shake out. Just shake out. Shake out the arms. I remember Mad Lizzie was very up. She was probably the beginning of kind of positive thinking. Stepping and clapping. Last time, here we go with the music. Mad Lizzie stepped out the pages of a Freeman's catalogue for crying out loud. You know, why are you wearing clothes that you would walk around Sainsbury's in when you could be in Lycra and a hairband? Away from Dire Straits, they were quite cool. The clothes became part of a feature. People would phone up and say, where did you get that jumper from? So I quite enjoyed just finding the right clothes for it. So it was very casual. We're going to get a bit of flexi in the old knees on this one. We just get the... Mad Lizzie and I were against one Thin. another. I think we both had an appeal in a different way. Oh, you haven't done your press-ups yet. I've no. always taught, uh, hopefully in a fun way, and made jokes. Yes, it's a serious business, but you feel so good doing it, and it's such fun. A little bit faster at home as well. Hers was very much beaty and fast. Cheers, Jeffrey. Well tried. <laughs> and her manner was terribly quick as well. Whereas mine was rather more languid, I think. Let's take a lesson from the cat. Let's arch our back, dropping our head down. And that's a marvellous way of getting rid of some of the menstrual pains that we ladies regrettably have to put up with. Those breakfast time fitness queens always seemed freakish to me. Just relax. But not for too long, ladies, because it's nearly the family's breakfast time. Highlight! In 1983, teenagers were breaking out of the suburbs, ripping up the kitchen lino and trying to spin on their heads. Check it out. London's South Bank had a touch of Harlem about it today when British exponents of the new breakdance craze took part in the capital's first festival. Some other sporting news, I suppose. London's kids are apparently the tops at hip hop. Breakdancing, body popping, you know what I mean, man? Um, that kind of thing. Yeah. Jeffrey Daniel and Shalma, he was top body popper. It was like a few of those old Marcel Marceau man got trapped behind a glass thing. I popped, I did the electric boogaloo, and I presented something that had never been seen before and something so fresh. The first one to moonwalk on television was a guy from Shalimar, because I remember seeing that on Top of the Pops and then subsequently everyone talked about Michael Jackson, but I'm sure it was the guy from Shalimar who did it first. So now my love... It's really called a backslide, but Michael changed the name to the moonwalk. <laughs> Michael Jackson. <laughs> it was just amazing. I thought, yeah, this guy's cool. And my sister said, how can he be walking forwards while he's moving backwards? Do you remember this? Is that, are you getting anything there? Is that, it's not as good as it used to be. The day that Shalimar turned up on TV and body popped, that was the most exciting day of my school years as a child. What was the man doing? You've never seen it before. You've never seen this before. And then all the little kids started doing it on the street. I mean, once that was picked up, everyone was doing it. I remember like walking through places like Leicester Square and you'd see the kids with their big beatboxes just putting the mats down and doing it in the open air. And you'd, and you'd stand and watch, and it was almost like a, a freaky thing to watch, and you'd think, oh, yeah, great, but uh, ooh, I couldn't do that. Hey you, the Rocksteady crew, um, and I instantly fell in love and thought breakdancing was my way forward, my way out of uh, out of the suburb. We're going to take a break now with the Rocksteady crew, and if you're a fan of dance crazes, then you'll know that they are the greatest at breaking. There's a new dance craze. It's probably been around for 20 years before it got to, you know, the BBC. 
and here for, uh, the Rocksteady crew and they're all in identical tracksuits and then they take turns going in the middle and spinning around and I just went, this is the most exciting thing I've ever seen in my life, I have to do it. We did the Roxy tour and we went to uh, London and Paris. When we got there, no one was breaking and, and we brought it there. There's no doubt that we brought it there. I remember desperately trying to make my mum peel up the lino in the kitchen so as I could have my own roll of lino, because you could walk around, tape it down, and then start breakdancing on the square. We got a little crew together, the Richmond Bronx posse, and, uh, and then we um, bought a lino. And this is how popular it was. Went into a uh, shop and bought a second-hand lino, and the guy went, is this, is this for breaking? So he knew, some old bloke knew all the moves. I never, ever really knew any breakdance moves. I was awful. The only thing that most amateur breakdancers did was the swan dive, which was the standing up and then diving and then, um, then trying to kind of look as if it was uh, an easy kind of descent to the floor. That was about as good as I got. I was in a breakdancing crew, which didn't go very well, I must say, because I tried to do a, a thing called a swan dive and I injured myself and I thought, <sighs> I don't think break dancing's for me. But the boys in the crew said I could be their mascot. <laughs> Clapping on the side. <laughs> Buffalo Girls was obviously a benchmark. That video was absolutely phenomenal. They were the guys. We met Malcolm McLaren, we did the video, we got ripped off, don't care about him. Let's move on. The idea of twisting on my head and doing all those kind of things were, uh, Oh no. No normal person can spin on the head. So I seem to call whenever me and my mates have a Disney body popping, it would take elaborate stuff whereby two of you would stand you up on your head and then rotate you quite slowly. It was something more admired from a father than actually practiced. There were a lot of injuries, a lot of ripped up shoulders, a lot of bashed heads, a lot of twisted knees, but we absolutely positively would not stop. Down the outside. We would get on like the lower part of our spine and on our shoulders what we call b-boy burns. It was kind of the mark of a true soldier. Break dancing is an amazing art form, and it, I don't think it will ever die. People are still doing it now. It was the most fun I think I've ever had in my life. If, if someone said to me, what part of your life would you want to relive now, I'd say, I'd say um, that threesome I had about six months ago. But apart from that, I'd say the break dancing. Try and edit that one. <laughs> Dear Just17, my boyfriend has a personal hygiene problem and I do not know how to tell him. <laughs> oh dear, oh dear. Ah, what a load of rubbish. Mm, 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 lovely. Uh, just get yourself a new boyfriend, love. Ugh. This morning, a brand new magazine has been launched. It's from the same stable that's created the highly successful smash hits and it's called Just17. <laughs> Suddenly, one week, this new magazine appeared, and it didn't look like any of the others because this wasn't just about fictional romance stories. This was a, a guide to a lifestyle. There was something quite adult about Just 17 because it was being written by adults who were actually not ever talking down to the reader. Just 17 was like my confidant. That was like my friend. It taught me a lot. Just 17 came along at the right time when that age group needed their kind of self-confidence and their self-assurance boosted. As I lie here, thinking of you. No one who was 17 read Just 17. Just 17 was for 14-year-olds who wanted to be, to be 17. Thinking of when you're writing for teenage girls, you never write for a 13-year-old. You write for a 17-year-old because you know, by 15, all right, they're not being served in pubs, but I'm guaranteeing you, you're just swigging cider down the park. I was. It was a bit of a badge in many ways, if you could kind of leave it hanging out of your school bag. Even then, as a 22-year-old, you know, I, I would try and get hold of just 17 and look at it, look at it over the shoulder, people on the bus and things like that, because it had good fashion in it. You chose the look for the very first cover of the magazine. Why did you choose the boxing look? Well, for the, it's actually tying in with the fashion which is actually going over the fashion pages inside the magazine, which is the sporty, casual look. 
We tried to keep it so it was uh, really high streety or things that we made rather than expensive gear. So we were always trying to think of ways to do fashion on a budget. We'd all sit round and uh, try and think of free gifts. The free gifts in magazines or on the covers were usually really tacky, but we thought we really had some good free gifts. Do they ever give away condoms? No, because in Holland, the Holland equivalent of Just 17 gave away condoms. That's what happened. I went to Holland and I was like, oh my God, there'd be like an absolute outcry in England if that happened, but we used to get combs. <laughs> The problem page was some of the best feedback that the magazine got, just in terms of sort of taking the temperature of, you know, the nation's teenagers. I used to read the agony pages all the time. and used to think, God, I'm so dull, I have nothing to write in about. I remember going to my parents going, why aren't our family more interesting? Can't we have a bit more tragedy in our lives? Because, you know, these people, they've all got divorces going on, they've got, you know, deaths and they're fat or they're skinny. And the biggest travesty in my life at that time was the fact that my hair wouldn't hold a demi-wave perm. Because there were 12,000 letters a year. Some of the most interesting stuff was a reflection of the times in which those girls were growing up. So it was fears about employment and unemployment, fears about education, an absolute horror of taking anything to the doctor that demanded you to remove even the stitch of clothing. Um, so a lot of guilty secrets. Be strong, yeah. I vaguely remember, but I could be wrong, that there was um, a guy on how to give a blowjob, but I just think that that might be... <laughs> that. That just might be my wild imagination. Oh, oh. Once they realised there was a forum for, for actually, you know, getting guilty stuff out, then of course the letters would come in, and that's the sort of thing they'd asked. You know, they wanted to, some of them wanted to know the calorie content. Oh, I'm, I'm not going to finish that sentence. We used to read the problem and go, oh, she's so disgusting. Look at this girl, she's having sex already. <laughs> Of course they were the jokers. There were boys who obviously lobbed their dicks onto tables and drew around them and sent you the pictures and is this the right size? And some of them were tiny and some of them were huge. And if they actually thought you were going to write back and say, well, that's a whopper you got there, son, or never mind the tiddlers, it's not the size that cuts, I just had to ignore those letters. I think the favourite letters were always the ones that made you feel, thank God there's someone more disturbed than me out there. I don't think my vagina is like other girls. The lips form two bumps and the skin is very red. It has goosebumps on it. Please help. Poor kid. Vaginas, I say, are as varied and different as faces, so don't worry. I wonder how on earth I knew that. <laughs> don't worry at all, there's nothing wrong with you. Well, quite right, there wasn't anything wrong with her, was there? Isn't that awful to think that people go through life thinking there's something terrible just because their fannies looks like everybody else's? Well, I think I did a service to the nation with that letter. All right. Uh, what B is a quiz show that started in 1983, had a very cheap set, watched by up to ten and a half million people and starred teenagers? <laughs> it was a teenage quiz game, and there would be two teenagers. It was very, very exciting uh, because the screen used to light up. This show, I have no idea what it was. Who was it? Bob Monkhouse? Let me eat, please, Bob. <laughs> no, it's Bob Holness. Let's play Blockbuster. Everybody watch Blockbusters. Everybody. And here is the host of Blockbusters, Bob Holness. Hello and welcome to Blockbusters, a brand new general knowledge quiz game in which we give away some magnificent prizes, not only to the contestants, but also to the schools they represent. Blockbusters did affect my life. It was suddenly a quiz show for children and young people that we actually wanted to watch before we'd had really dire things like screen tests, which were like an extra lesson. What F is preceded by pelvic? Pe yes, Tim? I always had a sort of intellectual chip on my shoulder and it was probably the one programme where I could actually answer the questions because it was kind of geared towards 14-year-olds and I was 20 at the time. What if was the West German who beat Seb Coe in the 800 metre... Yes, Tim? 
Time's run out. Do you know, Bob Holness was a great choice. He was actually the radio James Bond, and he brought a little bit of that flair to, um, to, to that game. Really, the stars of the show were the, were, the, were the pupils. First, we meet Alistair. Alistair, which part of the country do you come from? I come from Newbury in Berkshire. And the school? St. Bartholomew's School. Do you do anything outside school? You're one of those people that concentrates solely on schoolwork. Well, I fly with the Combined Cadet Force as often as I can. Do you? What do you fly? The de Havilland Chipmunk. Enjoy it, obviously. Oh, it's great. Well, good. The kids on Blockbuster were SWATs. I remember them as being SWATs and kind of... Hello, Bob. Yes, Bob. No, Bob. I'd like this, Bob. And very nicely spoken. James, welcome. Are you filled with trepidation? Uh, yes. <laughs> yes, I thought you might. It's a daunting yes. prospect. We asked the girls their interests. Do you have interests outside school? Yes, um, I'm quite interested in the church, church activities. Um, photography, acting, that sort, of, sort of thing. Quite a lot, right across the board. Yes, I, I mean, they really were dull people, weren't they, that went on blockbusters. You know, they, you knew that they'd never been near Tipex dinner and their sleeve, you know? You knew they were not the kids that would sit there at the back of class going, <sniffs> sniffing Tipex dinner, which was such a, a common thing to do during that time at school. You would always hope there would be one you could fancy and there never was. On the left is Paul Macy, sitting behind his gorilla and green hedgehog. I like the shirt. The Thank gorilla's you. name being what? It's Gus, donated by Lisa and Lee. What about the, the green hedgehog? Hey! Oh, hedgehog. it's, um... <laughs> they all had their mascots, and I would sort of look at these kind of guys, thinking, you know, how can a guy have a mascot? You've got a small teddy bear in your pocket to keep you company. You've yep. got, given to you by a fan, I believe. Yeah, it's given to me by Les, who lives in Birmingham. Oh, I see. Well, good for him. Right. Kids would have lots of fluffy stuff on the front of their... And um, that, that was always the big chat, where, what does that symbolise, what does that mean? Um, always something quite dull. Oh, and there's a brass object, I must include that. There's a brass Oh, hall. yes. What it's is it? from my brother, it's good luck, I don't know quite okay. what it is. The mascots were part of the joy of the programme. The nation would have erupted if those mascots had gone. I always used to get really excited when it came to a gold run. Is it a gold run? Dad! Everyone would come into the front room, sit down for the gold run. <laughs> Let's refer to the lads to see which one of them is going down. They're on the hot spot to go in for the second gold run. Well, there's a matter It's going to be yours, Stephen. It's your moment of truth, isn't it? Gold to gold in 60 seconds or less, right across the board. Tell us where you want to start on the left-hand side. AF. ITN newscaster who married Mark... Anna Bott. Ford. Yes. And DM. I remember having a very boring pair of national health glasses at the time, and my haircut was desperately unfashionable as well. Classically described as a, as a bald head. ER. What the girl gets when she accepts a proposal of marriage. Engagement ring. Yes. FL. It was a tremendously exciting experience. Um, I remember being absolutely bowled over every time I won a prize. GB. Argentine cruiser sunk in the fall. General Bogano. Yes, that's yeah! it! <laughs> there was one particular question I remember with great fondness because the question was based on the phrase a leap in the dark uh, and they went on to say what L do you make in the dark when you're unsure of the consequences of your action what L do you make in the dark when you can't see the consequences of some action and I remember for the next sort of two or three seconds not actually hearing what Bob Holness said yes Stephen I was gonna say love but I don't think that's no, true. No. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen it on video a couple of times since, and every time I think, <laughs> why did you say that? <laughs> what O is the generic word for any living animal or plant, including bacteria and viruses? Orgasm. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> what K is a Chinese ceremony of a basement? Yes, Pauline? Uh, Kumisatra? No, no, no. No, that's something quite different. <laughs> I suppose one of the longest lasting effects of blockbusters, as everybody will realise, I guess, is can I have a pea, please, Bob? Now then, I didn't want you telling me to shell the peas. No, sir. So I've got some frozen ones, right? Mm -hmm. I'll have a pea, please, Bob. No. Ah! <laughs> Is I. Well, can I have a pee, please, Bob? Never stopped finding that funny. <laughs> pee, please, Bob. Pee, please, Bob. Katie, I'll have a pee, please. Okay. Oh, God, you said absolutely. Wait, you said, have a pee, please. <laughs> Little old ladies at Fates come up to me, sidle up to me, and say, Can I have a pee, please, Bob? And their friends are waiting to see my reaction, you see. 
And they run back giggling because they've actually said, can I have a pee, please, Bob? We never actually asked for a pee, uh, which I suppose was one of my regrets, really. But on the other hand, it was a very hackneyed gag. And at the end of the day, the freshest gags are the best ones. Goodbye, see you next time round. Cheers. Here, remember these immortal words. I have something I want to tell you. Yes, Michael? I'm not like other guys. I'm different. <laughs> I mean, some people remember where they were when Kennedy was shot, and some saddos in 1983 remember where they were when the Thriller video was on just after midnight on Channel 4. Oh, I saw the video and everything. I was there. Me and the girlfriend parked ourselves, like a lot of other people, uh, in front of the uh, in front of the TV. You know, got the pizza and uh, and wine in. Took the phone off the hook and uh, and waited for it. You know, couldn't wait for it. What was it going to be like? You know. Honestly, we're out of gas. So, what are we going to do now? It was shot like a little mini film. I've never seen anything like it. The, the ultimate conceptual video with dialogue in. I'm sorry I didn't believe you. I thought I could exploit Michael's celebrity, being the biggest star in the world at that moment, and bring back the theatrical short. <laughs> Michael basically had seen American Werewolf in London and wanted to turn into a monster. That was his request. I have something I want to tell you. Yes, Michael. You know, I'm not like all the other guys. I'm different. Never a true word spoken. I'm not like other guys. Of course not. That's why I love you. No, I mean I'm different. What are you talking about? There was something genuinely sinister when he said, I'm not like other guys. You just thought, no, you're, you're really not, are you? He came out at the cinema with this girl he picked up and then he went down the road. Dun, 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 dun. Dun, 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 dun. It's close to midnight. Something evil's lurking in the dark. Oh, I'm a very big Michael Jackson fan. I was very nervous, but I was trying to stay very calm. But Dara, take the sound before you make it. If you read my Playboy issue, it states on there who's your favorite entertainer, and I have listed Michael as my favorite entertainer. So I was pretty stoked when I got it, when I got the job. You hear the door slam, and realize there's nowhere left to run. That was my biggest thing, was to give Michael some sex. Michael was always a non-threatening presence before, and I really felt there has to be some sexual tension. I hope that this is just imagination. It was the first time you saw Michael Jackson with a girl, and there, there was a good chemistry between them. When they told me I had to kiss Michael, they didn't say, you know, where. You know, now that I think about it, I should have probably planted him one right on the, on the lips there, but uh, I was young back then, didn't know what I was doing. I think I probably would have did a lot of things differently. <laughs> no, I'm just teasing. He was a good-looking boy then, wasn't he? I mean, he seemed sort of relatively normal then as well. Why did he keep going back to the, um, you know, to the plastic surgeon? Because he looked really good at that time. Darkness falls across the land. The midnight hour is close at hand. Creatures crawl in search of blood to terrorize y'all's neighborhood. Zombies had come out, they'd come out of the graves and they started coming at him and then he was all shocked and then it just turned and he went... Woo! the 
dance on um, Saturday Star Ship with Bon Iver Langford. The choreography was just stunning, and it, it was ugly choreography. The timing and the intricacy just made it a totally sexy experience. We shot one full night. We may have done that dance sequence, gosh, 30, 40 times. I'm going to show you my thriller teeth, okay? Uh, here's the bottom set. Here's the top set. And as you can see, just that alone all of a sudden makes you somebody that you're not. Each individual dancer was in the makeup chair for, I would say, three to four hours apiece. You looked in the mirror and it really took you back for a moment because it was really frightening. It was truly frightening. You could recognize yourself, but you also had this hideous premonition of possibly what you'll look like after you've been in the ground for a period of time. By the standards at the time, no one had done a video like that before. There'd been, you know, there'd been a few pop videos. But, I mean, like, when you think Bohemian Rhapsody was supposed to be a pop video, and it was just Queen playing, and then a bit with four heads. You know, it was hardly Steven Spielberg. It made videos an event, and it made the fact that suddenly you spent so much money on a video. It kind of set the scene for all the millions that were spent throughout the 80s in trying to outdo that video. Sadly, with hindsight, it probably turned him into the monster, in some people's opinion, that he later became, because it propelled him to being, like, probably the most famous person in the world. I guess that after Thriller, you could have gone to people in little tin huts in Rangoon and gone, who's this bloke? And then he'd gone, ah, oh, Michael Jackson, Thriller. Thriller was really an extraordinary thing. I was like, you're like in the eye of the hurricane. It was like being with Christ. Because people would see Mike, and they would start sobbing, they would faint or start screaming. It was, it was, it was weird. Michael Jackson, the number one artist in the world! You know, it's very hard, if not impossible, to remain sane under those circumstances. What's the problem? Come on, I'll take you home. Well, that was 1983, where it all began for me, the start of an international superstar's career. Yeah! So stick around, because on BBC Two now, there's another couple of stars coming up. It's Al Pacino and Michelle Pfeiffer. Lovely! Yeah! In the heartwarming family entertainment film, Scarface. Yeah! week it's 1984 
Wham! and the Style Council, just two of the bands featured on this I Love the 1980s BBC compilation CD.